China has a problem. The country is getting hotter, and it's getting wealthier. While in isolation one is a global challenge and the other a domestic triumph, in concert they present an issue because of this, the air conditioner. Fix China on its latitudes and move it along the longitudes, and one can see that its size, shape, and southernness is not all that different from the US's, and that reflects in its climate. Beijing's temperatures closely track with those of DC year-round, while Shanghai's reflect those of Atlanta. That's to say, China, like the US, is hot. Much of the US developed in an era of air conditioning. Florida, Texas, and Arizona had their biggest population influxes at a time when inside and out no longer correlated, and this is a direct contributor to the fact that the US today has the highest electricity consumption per capita of any major economy. China's marching down the same path. Two out of every five air conditioning units made today are being sold to a Chinese person. Simply put, as personal income grows, air conditioning use grows, and so on the hottest of hottest days, some 50% of electricity consumption in China is now directly devoted to cooling down buildings. And this is only a single instance of a broader phenomenon. Across the board, the exponential increase in electricity consumption as nations grow wealthier is a well-accepted and well-documented phenomenon. Other prosperous regions have found a tenuous equilibrium between wealth gains and efficiency gains. Europe and the US's year-over-year -year electricity consumptions have more or less plateaued, but China's looks like this. It's just growing, and growing, and growing. And, most crucially, no country the size of China has ever, in history, developed at the speed of China. Its people are marching up the wealth pyramid at an unprecedented pace, and so too, of course, is its electricity consumption. This has led to difficulties. China is no stranger to the occasional power crunch. In a rapidly growing economy, these effectively represent growing pains. But the power crunch across China in September and October of 2021 was different. As in other periods of unseasonably high temperatures, power-strapped grid operators accounted for an uptick in air conditioning and fans by cutting streetlights and other municipal power uses they could live without. Then they place cuts on industrial users, notifying manufacturers and suppliers for the likes of Tesla and Apple that factory operations would have to slow for the coming week or two. While the move put a damper on the Chinese economy rallying for the first time since pandemic shutdowns, a temporary slowdown wouldn't be a major issue in the grand scheme of things. Then it got worse. Scorching droughts persisted across central China, winds unexpectedly died in the north, and across the entire country, coal reserves dwindled to a day or two's worth. Suddenly, the power crunch became rolling blackouts. For hours, Chinese cities went dark. In Laoyang, cars stacked up when traffic lights shut off, and metal workers ended up in the hospital when factory exhaust systems shut down. Shops ran by candlelight, city advised residents to stock up on clean water, building managers asked tenants to take the stairs, while at least one family got stuck in an elevator when power suddenly cut out. The international media called it unprecedented, and some Chinese citizens compared the outages to living in North Korea. To understand the true source of the crisis, beyond the short-term simple supply and demand imbalance, one must understand China's electric grid, and to understand its grid, one must understand this. Coal is everything. The two other areas with similar GDPs, Europe and the US, produce about 18 and 21% of their electricity with coal, respectively. In China, it's 62%. In fact, about half of the entire world's coal power generation capacity is within the People's Republic. In context, this isn't surprising. Two or three decades ago, coal was far more significant in Europe and the US's energy mix, but in the years since, there's been a notable shift towards cleaner, more flexible, natural gas-fired power plants. China couldn't do that, at least not easily. One of the country's critical weaknesses in today's world is that it lacks significant domestic oil and gas production. It imports about half of the natural gas it uses, which means it's expensive, which means it doesn't use the fossil fuel for generating electricity, at least in any significant way. Meanwhile, China is swimming in coal. Enormous deposits sit in Inner Mongolia and the Shangxi and Shangxi provinces. The country has more natural coal deposits than anyone but Russia, Australia, and the US. Many forms of renewable electricity generation are now cost competitive with coal and gas generation, but remember, China has been growing unbelievably, unprecedentedly fast. While the overall cost per kilowatt hour of solar, for example, might be the same or lower than that of coal power, there's the question of when the money is spent. 
With solar, nearly all of the cost is upfront in the production and installation of panels. With coal, however, the cost is more distributed through the lifetime of use. There's a lower initial installation cost per unit of capacity, but it raises through time with use as coal has to be purchased to keep the generation ongoing. So when a country is growing at such a pace, it's much easier to spend less upfront to add capacity, knowing that more money is coming, rather than spend a larger amount upfront knowing the savings will come later. It's that simple reality that has undergirded the centrality of coal in China's energy mix. Now, the companies actually producing power in China are, almost universally, state-owned enterprises, but despite reporting up to the central government, on a day-to-day -day basis, these businesses do act with a certain degree of autonomy, responding to market conditions similar to how a privately owned enterprise would. But this is a unique market. Beijing regulates how much power producers get paid for the electricity they make. Typically it hovers around 8 cents per kilowatt hour, far below the world average. The country considers this crucial because, still today, it's a largely industrial economy. Industry requires power, and just as China is competitive with the rest of the world thanks to its low labor costs, it's also competitive thanks to its low electricity costs. But low costs mean nothing if there's no electricity to be consumed. Notably, and crucially, Beijing does not regulate the cost of coal. It fluctuates wildly up and down, just as it does in the rest of the world. So companies get paid a fixed amount for what they make, but their input cost, the coal, changes. It doesn't take an expert to spot the potential issue with this. So why not renewables? Ignoring for the moment the difficulties in upfront financing, if solar and wind are competitive in cost with coal-fired power and aren't vulnerable to the short-term up and down fluctuations in coal prices, wouldn't they be the clear winner? Wouldn't a solar installation producing for less than 8 cents per kilowatt hour be a guaranteed profit machine? Yes, but. Most Chinese people live where favorable conditions for renewable energy simply aren't. The country's greatest solar energy potential lies largely in the arid west and along the northern border. The same goes for wind. These regions in the far west and borderland north are also where the nation's most consistent wind potentials lie. The difficulty is, more than 90% of China's population resides on the southeast side of this divide, far from the most productive areas for renewables. Even when it comes to the nation's most heavily developed renewable, hydropower, many of the nation's largest dams are located in southern and southwestern China, near moderately populated areas but still far from the most densely populated provinces. Making the most of renewable resources and the already impressive amount of renewable infrastructure the central government has built out then requires efficient means of transferring electricity over vast distances and a flexible, interconnected grid. Alongside the massive dams, solar installations, and wind farms China's taken on in the past decade is an equally impressive assortment of transmission lines increasingly connecting the sunny, windswept hinterlands to population and industrial centers. This is an ultra-high voltage power line, and of the 36 that exist globally, China's home to 34 of them with plans to build more. While standard overhead transmission lines run from 110 to 500 kilovolts, these run from 800 to 1100, resulting in massive efficiency gains and in turn allowing these long distance lines to move up to five times the power of a standard line. In China, they've been identified as the key to linking areas of high energy consumption with areas of high renewable production. And yet, while these infrastructure investments have built out wind and solar plants in remote areas as far east as the deserts of Xinjiang, then connected them directly to industrial centers like the Anhui province 2,000 miles or 3,200 kilometers away, China has yet to make the most out of their green investments. At the end of 2020, a report surfaced that China's future forward ultra-high voltage lines were only running at a paltry 60% of capacity. For a country with a still-climbing coal habit, this dramatic underutilization was disappointing, but not necessarily an indictment of the physical grid, rather an indictment of how China's grid works on a policy and pricing level. China's yet to properly incentivize their renewables. They've addressed the supply side, but largely ignored demand. Critical to the full implementation of China's solar and wind farms and the power lines connecting them to population centers is the willingness of Chinese provinces to buy energy from one another. Because energy rates are set by the government rather than a market, provinces, which are largely in charge of their own grids, have prioritized purchasing electricity within their own borders, regardless of its origin, to keep the money local. Why give another province the work that could exist within? And because the provinces that need more power are more densely populated or more industrialized, they're probably eastern or coastal and likely buying power from nearby coal plants rather than out-of-province renewables. 
Available renewables then take a back seat. They get used mostly as provinces buy this electricity as capacity insurance during peak surges. While flexible, interconnected, and national in theory, China's grid is still just more regional, rudimentary, and coal-oriented in practice. Up until today, China's grid has largely done enough to facilitate the nation's monumental rise, but as Chinese coal consumption, consumer standards, average temperatures, and weather variability rise too, the challenge will be keeping up. And in 2021, it didn't. Given the continued centrality of coal in China's energy mix, the move they took in the middle of 2020 was bold. They banned Australian coal. This move occurred in response to the Western nation's calls for an investigation into the origins of COVID-19, but up until that point, Australia supplied around half of China's imported coal. Still, as the world's largest coal producer by orders of magnitude, the ban on Australian coal, even when entering winter, could be managed, as long as it was the only challenge to manage. Next came 2021, and with it, the recovery. As China's strict quarantine and control measures virtually eliminated the COVID virus from its territory, construction and heavy industry roared back. While the sector signaled signs of life from the previously dormant Chinese economy, they also put pressure on the grid as the first half of 2021 saw an 11% increase in coal demand from the year prior and an 8% increase from 2019. But as business boomed under the surface, cracks were beginning to show. While China was burning more coal than years prior, it was hardly producing any. Here, in the Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region, China closed over 30 mines over land use violations, halting production for months. Here, in Shengxi, coal mines closed for over a month for safety inspections after a worker died in an accident. And at the same time domestic supply hit snags, so too did international. Indonesia, China's newest number one coal supplier, was hit by a heavy storm season that derailed its export goals. Heavy storms led to record flooding in Shenzhou, China too, requiring emergency reroutes of coal into Henan province. But the rain didn't last, and as 2021 progressed, much of China entered an intense drought which severely hampered hydroelectric production. All the while, global coal prices skyrocketed to over $200 per metric ton, four times its average from a year prior. Chinese mines struggled to produce, while Chinese power providers drained reserves to at least minimize their losses while producing for a higher cost than they could sell, then claimed they were going offline for maintenance to further mitigate their financial damage. Twenty separate provinces experienced some of the most significant rolling blackouts in decades. The global supply chain was thrown into further turmoil as producers were forced to cut back or shut down production. While the crisis passed, the bedrock of the nation's economy had been exposed as a brittle embarrassment of a system. China stuck between a rock and a hard place. The rock is the expectation, both domestic and international, of continued tremendous economic growth, and the hard place is the unmitigated, escalating global climate crisis. China knows it needs to cut back. It knows this both because of the ironclad science of climate change and because of its own practical experience. Less than a decade ago, China, and specifically Beijing, had some of the worst air quality in the world. And this wasn't merely unpleasant. While it's tough to accurately measure, researchers have attributed 1, 2, or 3,000 excess deaths not per year, but per day to air pollution in China. The issue escalated to such a degree that international employers started awarding hazard pay to staff sent to the country to compensate for the very real health effects of simply existing in China. The largest single factor behind this tremendous air pollution was coal, both for power generation and household heating purposes. While well, in the decades since the country has made tremendous, unprecedentedly fast progress in improving its air quality, it's still far above World Health Organization targets and is still the source of myriad excess deaths per year, but in this instance, China's air quality crisis served a demonstration to Beijing that its coal habit comes with a very real, very tangible cost. Simultaneously, the world recognizes it needs to tackle the climate crisis to avoid the worst future of unlivable temperatures, destructive sea level rise, and deadly superstorms. The world, and China itself, also recognize that China is, by an enormous margin, the single largest source of carbon emissions, responsible for more than double the CO2 than the US, even if per capita emissions are lower. And remember, its trend line looks like this. All eyes are on China to play its part. So, as the world descended on Glasgow for the 26th United Nations Climate Change Conference, China made a commitment. 
the nation would reach peak carbon emissions by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2060. This is aggressive. Japan said it will reach carbon neutrality 37 years after its carbon peak. The US is giving itself 43 years, and the EU a full 71. China is saying they'll do it in 30, despite the fact that their peak will be far higher than any others. But this is China. This is the country that committed to 50 years of Hong Kong autonomy. This is the country that said a mere 300 died in Tiananmen Square. This is the country that says all that's going on in Xinjiang is the lawful detention of Uyghur terrorists. Can any Chinese commitment be considered truthful? Well, when it comes to climate, it's possible. At the 2009 iteration of the UN Conference on Climate Change, China committed to reducing its carbon emissions per unit of GDP, a metric known as carbon intensity, by 45% relative to 2005 levels by 2020. According to the United Nations itself, China hit this three years early in 2017. At COP21 in Paris in 2015, the country committed to go even further and reduce carbon intensity by 65% relative to 2005 levels by 2030, and China still has every chance in the world to hit that. So that's to say, based on the past promises, maybe China actually will peak its emissions by 2030. But back when originally setting its carbon intensity targets, the primary criticism among experts was that China was supposedly already on the path to hit 45% reduction by 2020. In fact, according to International Energy Agency data, the pace of decline actually slowed in the five years after the 2009 commitment relative to the five years before. Again, carbon intensity is a measure of emissions per unit of GDP, not overall emissions, so a reduction in carbon intensity was to be expected as the country's economy started to shift from industrial to service-based. The new 2030 carbon peaking goal, however, is different. China is not currently on that path, and with just seven years left on the clock, it's getting hard to believe that it can get on that path. China's climate commitments came before its power crisis, and 2021 and 2022 have demonstrated where the nation's priorities lie. A majority of the world's planned future coal power plant construction is within China, and just last year, Beijing authorized another 370 million tons worth of coal production to go online, reversing their prior commitments to reduce the fossil fuels production. Analysts and observers have also noted a marked tone shift among Chinese officials, more often bringing up the need for energy security in their transition towards renewables. And in December 2021, at China's annual Central Economic Work Conference, policymakers finally suggested what everyone else already knew that there could be a delay in hitting their emissions targets as they focus on their economy. The economic story of China over the past decade has been this, a slow slide out of the era of record-setting GDP growth, placing pressure on the leaders whose power is undergirded by the continued march towards superpower status. But it's clearer than ever that China's GDP growth is tremendously linked to carbon output, and that carbon output has to stop for the health of its own citizens, for the pressure placed by the international community, and for the pragmatic global realities of climate change. So what's happening now is a tenuous dance. They can take one step forward on decarbonizing, but that relies on taking one step back on growth. They can take one step forward on growth, but that requires taking one step back on diplomatic stature. China can manage and mitigate, but at the end of the day, the past decade has borne out that renewables can't come soon enough, because soon enough, in China's eyes, is the pace of growth enabled only by low-cost, high-carbon energy. It's economy versus climate, social order versus public health, tomorrow versus the day after. Having met plenty of Wendover viewers, I know that there tends to be a bit of a type. Most of you are highly motivated people continuously working towards a defined set of goals, whether they be personal, career, or a mix of both. So that means you're probably the type of person that values your time highly and fills it up with work, passion, social activities, critical downtime, and more. So my question to you is, why waste your time at the grocery store? Planning meals, driving or walking to the store, searching through the aisles, waiting in line to check out, all that's unnecessary thanks to services like our sponsor, HelloFresh. Basically, HelloFresh is a meal kit that gives you all the upsides of home cooking without any of the downsides. You select what you want to eat from more than 30 weekly recipes, then a box arrives on your doorstep with all the ingredients and recipes you need to cook those meals. This cuts out all the boring bits, shopping and a lot of the prep, so you skip straight to cooking, and in about 30 minutes you have a delicious, fresh, home-cooked meal. 
This is all surprisingly affordable and fairly eco-friendly. Getting the exact right amount of ingredients cuts food waste down by 25%, and a University of Michigan study found that their streamlined supply chain means the carbon emissions of a HelloFresh meal are actually lower than that of an equivalent bought through a grocery store. I've used HelloFresh since 2020, before they even became a channel sponsor, and have made hundreds of delicious meals through them like these bulgogi meatballs. I'd really recommend giving them a try as they could completely transform the way you eat, especially since you can click the button on screen or go to HelloFresh.com and use code WENDOVER60 for 60% off plus free shipping.